Come on, Buck. He's getting all excited as we've been getting closer. Yeah. Buck, do you know where you are? Yeah, probably. This is the road that leads to Alex's. Stopping and smelling things, it almost seems like he's, he has a familiar scent because this road here, Buck has ridden it probably with Alex before or at least walked it or dog sledded it. I see him sniffing the trail and looking up towards the direction where Alex's is. Where are we, Buck? Buck's like, it's this way, guys. Good boy. Good boy. Buck's journey home. This is Ted, I'm Jim, and this is my dog, Buck. We've explored over 10,000 miles of the world's most brutal terrain. Now, we have the two-week, 140-mile canoe trip in the Tomogamy backcountry. We're gonna go visit a friend of ours named Alex Matthias, who's an Aboriginal elder that lives in the bush. We got an incredible route coming up. Hopefully, we didn't bite off more than we can chew. There's been some forest fires in the area. Hopefully, we can stay clear of those. God willing, we should be done this trip in 15 days if all goes well. So basically our adventure is starting right now. We made it to Alex's. Are you back home, Buck? You know, I'm just looking really forward to, to seeing Alex. He is actually the person that gave me Buck about maybe four years ago or something like that. He's lived in the bush in a cabin completely off grid for well over 40 years now. You know, Alex is Ojibwe and he is one of the last native language speakers. So he speaks fluent Ojibwe. That was actually his first language. And he lives, you know, off the reserve, just on ancestral land throughout his entire life, trapping, living off the land. And that was his family's <laughs> livelihood. I'm really excited to learn from Alex, you know, his knowledge of plants, his knowledge of the area, his knowledge of, of the trees, and uh, also uh, what, what this area means to him. You know, Buck's definitely happy to see him and uh, looking forward to introducing Ted to him and also spending some time at his place with him. Um, there hasn't been any time to slow down or slack off on this trip, that's for sure. It's going to be awesome. So we're just here with Alex and uh, he's going to show us how he sets a snare for rabbits. Should be uh, interesting to learn this. Now, right in here, it looks like he run through here. So uh, the idea is to set the snare right on our trail. See the, where the, earth, the moss is back down. And you got to set it kind of in the bush because you don't want uh, the hawks and the ravens to get them before you do. So you want to put it where, where the birds won't be able to see it if you yeah, catch yeah. one. The first idea is to get a cross piece. You don't want to make much more than uh, two foot long. That's about accurate size for a rabbit, you know. When you twist the wire, you got to twist the whole thing so they work it against each other. You try to steer. Hole. Again, you gotta work both parts of the wire because you just can't wrap one side. You gotta patch them together good. And then you put right where he'll be going. And you gotta have a certain height as well. You can put it right down the wall. That'd be about the, the right height. The whole trick is uh, only one, one entrance really you should get through. It's kind of wide there, so you have to block it off. In most cases, I usually uh, get a piece uh, and brush it out so it's really easy to block. You gotta make sure everything you do is dry or dead because the rabbit will eat anything that's green. You know? So you put this uh, little stick just below the bottom of the snare to keep it steady because the rabbit can something we sat there and go underneath, but the, you know, the stick there usually stops and uh, gets caught. We've been doing it for many years, so. <laughs> yeah. And we never starve, so. The best way to cook it, I was like a big pot of stew, wrap the stew, the, the meat goes far. I had about 30 wraps all winter. Yeah. yeah. Good meal. Alex has taken us out to do a little fishing. Uh, obviously, knows this area really well. He even used to be a fishing guide at one time, so. Uh, feeling pretty lucky to be able to get out and do some fishing. Maybe Ted will actually be able to catch something for once. Yeah, maybe Alex will have to catch it and then pass me the rod. I don't know. 
<laughs> you being your kid making a career on this? <laughs> yeah. Pretty deep little hole here, though. Yeah, yeah, I think we have about 15 or 20 feet in the middle of it. Wow. Oh, they can fight a little bit. Yeah. Oh, there is a net. Oh, there is a net. Come on, hit it, hit it. Oh, there's two big guys. Look, look, Jim, you see him? I'm not catching fish. Ah, a little bigger. I'm not really jealous because they're all really small. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But still. The lively one, that one, eh? Look at that. Look at those guys. Well, they're big ones, anyway. Oh, I got him. Oh, he's gone. I mean, oh, that sucks. You can yeah. see him there over the log. You see him? He's following me. Look at that. Look at how delicious that looks. If that was a fish, I'd be eating that all day. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hit it, hit it, hit it, hit there it. There you go, bud. There you go. Yes. Oh, oh, what a, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 go under there. You're going to take one. Oh. There you go. Uh, nice one, Ted. Uh, Three and a half, probably. Yeah? Yeah. Good job, Ted. No, Jim is jealous. Now I'm jealous. Yeah. <laughs> Ted, look at oh. oh, he's a big guy. Get away? No, no, no. Oh, that's a big one, Jim. Pretty good. Yeah, baby. All right, caught a nice one. Al's secret uh, fishing hole here. So, just got back from a little fishing trip with Alex, and uh, yeah, me and Ted had a blast. We kept two nice ones for dinner tonight, and we released a ton more, so a uh, solid little fishing trip. You guys ever tried uh, Old Bay seasoning? So I just got wise to that recently. I'm just like, oh, game changer. So good. You know, Alex on his beach, he's actually found an arrowhead that he had dated back to 8,000 years. So he has a very awesome uh, collection actually of hand tooled stone points that he's found. And this one here, a broken arrowhead. I Using stone points and you hit like a tree. Yeah, yeah. Snap. No, this one here is uh, 5,000 years old. 5,000 yeah, years old. Yeah, and this one here in back to us, it was 8,000 years old. It's found here, but we don't have a, we don't have a kind of rock. So it, like, yeah. they must have traded, you know, as you go farther north, they don't have the birch like we had, so they had to make canoes back there. So they must have bought down the flint or got lost during the battle with the Iroquois when they were, you know, when, when they just come through here. And it's made to, to spin as it flies through the air. It's got a little twist it's in it. Got a little, yeah, a little bend in it, you know. It's not flat. You see the difference? So it's intentional then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one here, I, I, I think it's some kind of tool. It looks like that. I think it was tool when you poke the beaver up the, you know, to start skinning it. Almost like it looks like a shingle knife. Yeah. And this one here is one I, my daughter found on Bear Island. It's local rock, you can tell. And I don't know if somebody's trying to make a, a spearhead or actually made one, you know. That looks like almost like shale or something. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah, stronger. Yeah. So, uh, that's it. Alex does. Uh, Alex is tours. basically a museum here. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just heading up a small creek right now with Alex. Might be a challenge to get up here. We don't know if there's going to be down trees over the creek and that kind of thing. Here's a dam. The one there by last year, it was about four feet high, and that's a hill. Wow. Got a little run out of shot off the motor. Okay. okay. And we'll see how far we can go. Okay, okay, get in, guys. So this is a kind of an extension of uh, the, like a logging road that came up. Look at the size of the Look, tree. The we come for a walk from my old place. Yeah. We can go right across the bridge at one time. Yeah. One over there. Yeah. Oh, beaver. No, I don't I see him. Me. I think he hid in these reeds. Probably under the weeds. Hey, Ted. What? I see him. He's straight. Right there, right? Yeah, he's straight right there. Right here. Got that one. 
So uh, Alex was just telling us that, that uh, bears will dig into the tree and pull the bark off, looking for ants to eat. Pretty cool, I wouldn't have known that. So uh, we're coming down the creek here, and uh, Alex saw some, what are they called, arrowheads? Yeah, one of the, like, potatoes. I mean, small potatoes. You know, he's always got them around. He's not performed the ball yet. No, no, that's not that way. When we pull them out, it, this is solid down about here. And the balls, you don't get them much bigger than wee potatoes. Eh? You just get them in September or end of September sometime before the frost comes. Eh? I thought I'd pick up 100 pounds here today. Supply for the winter. So, um, Al's going to show us how to uh, make a moose call out of uh, birch bark. Ooh, we might luck out here, buddy. You get the bark right time of year, the bark is thicker. Probably twice as thick as this, because then really a bark should have came with it. But in the meantime, I'm gonna keep my eyes open for some uh, roots of a spruce tree for stitching it. Any kind of root will work, but uh, spruce is uh, the most common. You get a better chance to get a longer strips. They're not dry and they're still green and flexible. I'd like to get a piece of a, at least a foot The idea is to, in most cases, put inside out on the birch. I'm going to tie this first and I'll put some holes in it so it stays in a position for a while until I'm finished working on it. Make sure this doesn't unravel on you, you know? I'm trying to do this so I can keep it moist. Don't dry too fast. You don't need no knots because that's not gonna come out of there. It happens sometimes if you're out hunting and you lose your horn and damage your horn, so you gotta make a temporary one. This is more like a temporary one. We'll see how it sounds. That was a uh, bull call that what I just made now. Uh, but some people were cut moose in the, in, out of the canoe, they'll dip it into the water and get that muffled sound, more muffled sound like a. But if another bull is answering him, or if he's answering you, he'll, he'll just make a grunt like this. Eh? You know, like short grunts. He, he grunt every step he takes, come towards you. Like, when you can't get a cow calling her calf, she'll, it, it, it'll make noise like this. You know, the calf's kind of getting out of her sight or something, she'll call him back. You know? It seems like uh, more of a speaker, I guess, you know, like yeah. cover more area. It really lasts a few years because of birch bark. Eh? When you're making a real good one, you cut this off even and it'll have a spruce root, a circular spruce root, so you have a ring so it protects from, you know, squashing and stuff. Yeah. Ted and I are just here in the Wakimaka Triangle Old Growth Forest. It is the last stand of eastern red and white pines that has never been logged in the entire world. When the province of Ontario was willing to negotiate with the native people, the native people so we were going to keep this site sacred. In 50 years, the next generation decided they wanted to come back. Is it going to be available for them to come back? Not if they lose it. 